Welcome to an online Bible study from Harborside Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. Uh, I was looking at my material just uh, yesterday, and uh, it's only taken us six months. It's only taken us six months to get through 2 Corinthians, which is, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Um, uh, don't don't ask don't 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 ask the congregation right okay um, that's a little longer than a semester right so uh, I'd have maybe it could be a you know a two part two part class you know Second uh, Corinthians one Second Corinthians two whatever that is okay so uh, w- the 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 number one thing I hope you have gotten out of our time together in Second Corinthians comes from chapter twelve, and the latter part of chapter eleven. Basically, you remember Paul said in in chapter eleven about the the labors and uh, the um, the beatings and the stonings and the shipwrecks and the perils and so forth. You remember that? Um, but then again, in, in uh, chapter 12, that first part of chapter 12, he was talking about um, that thorn in the flesh. We all remember that one, right? But what did God give him? We find it in chapter 12 and verse number 9 grace and that really is is i suppose i should have prefaced our study instead of uh ending it with these thoughts but um that really is what we need when we go through trials isn't it is god's grace and and that is what turns those trials into triumphs it's god's grace uh i'm i'm in the the process of reading a book that I, I, I don't I think I mentioned it recently uh, in one of our services um, it's presented by a, by an organization called the voice of the martyrs and this particular book is basically just a, um, a short autobiography if you want to call it that of a gentleman that works with the voice of the martyrs and what he does he goes into restricted and closed countries now how he gets in there i have no idea how he talks to christians in these closed and restricted countries i have no idea other than god's grace anyway i was reading one uh, of of these little uh, snippets of testimony one of the people that he came in contact with recently this gentleman is in iran uh, this particular christian and um this gentleman is an evangelist in Iran, and he has led thousands of people to the Lord in Iran. Okay? He was arrested, and he, he said, I, 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 as, as I was, they, they, they let me know, basically, we're coming to get you on this particular day. And he said, I was thinking about running, and then I got to thinking about the fact that um, if God wants me arrested, God's going to take care of me. He spent almost a month in solitary confinement. They sent him from solitary confinement to one of the most dangerous places of this prison in Iran, and he He won two dozen people to the Lord. He came in contact. He came up up above, uh, in front of a judge, you know, and and over there, I mean, it's Sharia law, and the the judges up there, they don't don't adjudicate according to a constitution necessarily. Um, And the judge says, why are you here? And the guy told him, and the judge said, but you're such a good prisoner. I think we'll let you go. He had the opportunity to post bail. He waited 
for over a week to post bail because some of the prisoners in this most dangerous part of the prison in Iran wanted him to stay. What is that? That's God's grace. And here in America, we have no idea. I, I hope and I pray that it never gets to be that bad here in America, where we are, we are literally in fear for our lives, in fear of imprisonment. It could be, it could, could devolve down into that, right? But as Paul is closing this very personal letter of his, I, I mentioned last time as we started this last portion uh, of this closing section of his letter, he uses three approaches to motivate and encourage the Corinthians toward being obedient to the Lord. And the first one we looked at last time was to shame them. You know, and that, that's a hard thing, isn't it? How many of you have ever been, well, I'll put it this way. How many of you known anybody that got caught for something they shouldn't have done? Maybe it was one of your siblings, right? Who did that? And you point the finger, right? You know how that works. How many of us have ever done that? with our children. Shame on you. Paul does that. He uses a second approach beginning in chapter 13, the first eight verses here. We'll start there this evening. I want to finish up and then uh, we'll, we'll look at something else. We'll start another study uh, here next week. But uh, what he does here uh, in verses 1 through 8 of 2 Corinthians 13 uh, is to warn them. Uh, he shames them, and then he warns them. Let's read these verses, and then I'll have a word of prayer. 2 Corinthians 13.1 says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being ab absent now, I write unto them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you were it is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, we've had over these months, Lord, to look through this book and to study it. And, and Lord, I, I truly do hope that it's been helpful to these dear folks and uh, just a blessing to them. I know it's been a blessing to myself to uh, dive back into it and to study it. And, and Lord, we thank you for the grace that you showed to Paul. Um, we also know, Lord, that it's not just to Paul that you show grace. You show grace to all of us. And that makes the trials, that can turn the trials into triumphs, no matter what we might face. And we pray, Lord, that you would just help us in these last days, these perilous times, these times where we see our country going farther and farther away from thee and, and, and so much uh, sin and, and uh, terrible wickedness, Lord, um, sweeping across our country. We pray that you would help us as your people just to be good testimonies Help us, Lord, to get the gospel out as best we can, uh, because that, that is really the, the greatest problem that anybody on the face of this planet has is their sin problem. And, Lord, as this evangelist in Iran has given testimony um, that I mentioned just a little bit ago, I pray, we, we pray that you would help us, Lord, uh, not, to, not to shy away from, from difficulties, from trials, um, help us to understand that every trial that we come in, in contact 
with every trial that we face, every place that we have to go. Maybe it's a doctor's appointment. Maybe it's a, a, a new employer. Maybe it's it, it, it just, maybe it is to court. Maybe it's just uh, across the street to help somebody out. Maybe it is, Lord, to um, just encourage somebody in the Lord. We, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of, of the fact that you bring us in, in contact with people and, and bring us into, into trials to go through them for your honor and your glory. And there's a reasoning behind it. And we praise you and thank you for, for leading us and bringing us through the trials that you have in the past. And uh, many are going through right now, Lord. And uh, we know certainly that until you come, we'll see more, more trials, we'll face more difficulties. And yet, Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient. When we are weak, you are strong. And we praise you and thank you for that. We praise you as we finish up that you would just help us to focus our attention upon this last uh, bit of this letter. Uh, we pray especially for our prayer time, Lord, that you would just work in every circumstance that we'll bring before you now in Jesus' name. Amen. What was Paul warning them of? Well, there are two warnings here to begin with. It, the, the first one is to prepare yourself. He says, for this is the third time I'm coming to you. Um, in verse number two, I, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present, okay? Being absent, um, he says there in verse number two, I will not spare. When I come, I will not spare. Uh, having just listed some of the, now, uh, if you go back to uh, the latter part of chapter 12, he talks about uh, uncleanness and fornication, lasciviousness. Verse number 20, uh, he says there, lest there be debates and envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults, and all of that. All of those things, it's just not a list that Paul gives. You know, maybe these things are going on. We'll just throw everything against the, uh, the wall and see what sticks. All of these things were going on in the church. And his encouragement to the Christians is to deal with those things. Now, let me ask this question of you. How many of us really enjoy having to reprimand our children and deal with their sin? How many of us really enjoy that? Anybody? Okay. It, it depends on what mood you're in. Okay. All right. Um, that brings, brings to my mind a verse in Ephesians. It says, be ye angry and sin not. Okay. Pardon me? For, see, I, I just open-ended that thing, didn't I? It just said children, right? Okay. Okay. Um, I know I have to be careful because I have one sitting here, um, but I don't enjoy that. I don't. Um, you know, not that my boys are, you know, uh, hellions and rebellious and that kind of thing. They're not. I'm thankful for that. Um, but you, you can certainly appreciate uh, even when they were small, when your children were small, anytime you have a difficulty, a problem uh, in the family that you have to deal with, Nobody likes to have to deal with that. And so it is with the Apostle Paul. He didn't want to have to come to Corinth whenever he was allowed by the Lord to do that, to have to deal with and wrestle with and discipline the problems that were going on. And he warns them. Um, he refers back to Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15, where it talks about basically verse number one there in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And he implies further church discipline upon his arrival. Basically what he's saying is, and warning them in this way, you need as a church, as a local body of believers, to deal with this problem. Or when I get there, I will. Now that's difficult, isn't it? 
I mean, how many of you moms or how many of us as children were told by our mothers, wait till your father gets home, right? Wasn't there a, wasn't, wasn't there a TV program? That, okay. Um, you know, wait till your father gets home, okay? And sometimes that would shame us into, <gasps> right? Not, oh, man. Uh, okay, not dad, because uh, we know dad's bigger, stronger, fiercer, whatever, 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 whatever. Okay, although my mom could wield a fly swatter with the best of anybody, I'm telling you what. Um, but Paul is indicating uh, his adherence to some godly principles, okay, to ad- administering church discipline. He's going to deal with anybody who opposed the authority of God's word. He's going to basically bring the Bible to bear, okay? Because when we're rebellious, whether it be uh, in, in any circumstance, in the church, in the home, at work, or wherever we happen to be, basically what are we proving? Who are we really rebelling against, especially if we're re- rebelling against authority? Who are we really uh, rebelling against I might say I don't like the president and I'm not going to listen to anything he has to say okay that may be the case but who allowed the president to be put in the position of the president God does okay God is in control doesn't take God by surprise when somebody gets elected, whether it be here in this country or someplace else. I was watching a news program just recently. Uh, do you have any idea where the little, the little country of Niger is? It, 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 in, in, in 21st century English, it's pronounced Niger, unless you happen to be on the African continent, and it's Niger, okay, because it's a French was a French colony, okay? Uh, And they pronounced things differently, okay? Um, There's been a coup take take place some time ago, and the representative from our government was wanting to meet with a representative, actually the duly elected, democratically elected president of Niger. And whoever these rebels are said, ain't happening. We're not going to let it happen. And then the military got involved over in Niger. And guess what happened? I think the meeting went on. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but when, when Paul is saying, basically, deal with these problems or I will, there's some weight to that. Because who is Paul? Yeah, he, he's, he, he, he's, I know Jesus is the founder of the church, but Paul planted it, right? He planted it, okay? Uh, he went by God's direction and saw people saved and led them to Christ and so forth and spent 18 months there um, grind, gr- grounding them in the, in the truth and so forth. But he warns them, you need to take care of this problem. If you don't, I will. Okay, now think about this for just a second. If we're, again, disobedient to the Lord, rebellious against the principles that we find in God's word, Does God get involved in that? The answer to the question is, yes, he does, okay? But a lot of times when we think about doing right, handling sin the way we ought to, sometimes we just we, we dismiss it. We don't think about it. It was like, nah, psh, it's, it's no big deal. But it is, isn't it? And, and if we really had a reverence for God like we ought to, how would we handle our sin? If, 
if God handled rebellion amongst his people the way he handled rebellion back during the wilderness wandering, would we be a little more careful about what we did knowing that if, okay, if, if God really could, and I remember those guys, you know, I remember when the, the earth swallowed up a whole bunch of them. I remember when fire fell from heaven and consumed a bunch of them. Think about in Elijah's day, okay, when the fire of God fell on a sacrifice, okay? If God did that today, do you think we as his people would be as rebellious as we are? No. We forget about the snakes. Yes, the snakes too, right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that, there's a good point because we are under it's it's God's grace, um, and, and which which is again an amazing thing. But you sometimes you wonder. Not so much for us because we're in church, right? So we know a whole lot of people that aren't, right? We know a whole lot of people that um, are being blessed by the Lord. Maybe in our little minds we think and don't deserve it. Why doesn't he? You know, because he told Moses when, when the children of Israel were rebellious for the umpteenth time, basically, back up, I'm going to kill them all, and I'm going to start over with you. Remember that? And what did Moses say? He said, if you're going to kill anybody kill me it's a good thing I wasn't there right because I mean, think about it would you have been would you have been so compassionate to do what Moses did and if we're honest with ourselves we'll probably say huh uh-uh. I'd have been standing there going oh there's one <laughs> yeah there's one there's a He's on, no, he's on the other side of that tree. Yep, there, ah, there you go. We might not have been so compassionate. But how should we handle sin? The Bible gives us a lot of instruction in that regard. Of course, Matthew 18 is, is the process, basically. Okay, if your brother has ought against you, if there's problems. How many have ever had... Well, okay, let's, let's make it easier. How many of you have ever known anybody had some problem with somebody else? Right? Um, you know, you got two coworkers. You got whatever it is, what, so on and so on, and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and um, uh, how, how, did they hand, how should you handle it? How should you handle it? What would you, if, if you had two people came to you, they know you're a Christian, and there's, they, they've got this problem, and everybody at the work site knows about it. And one of them comes to you and says, man, I, know, I, got, I want to get this thing taken care of. How should I handle it? What would you do? What would you say? <laughs> 740-525-1977. Call him, right? He'll tell you. But how, do, how should we handle it? How should we pass those things on? How, how should we take care of those difficulties that are between, we'll say, brother, even brothers and sisters in Christ? How do we handle it? Is there a process? Well, the first thing you do, well, I'll put it this way. The first thing you don't do is get on Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, or any kind of social media and go, <laughs> right? What do you do? What's Matthew 18 say? You go to them alone. Man to man, eyeball to eyeball, woman to woman, 
eyeball to eyeball, and you deal with it. If for whatever reason they tell you to get bent, go pound sand, get out of here, I'm not doing that, then what do you do? Then you take it to TikTok and Snapchat and all that, right? No. Then you take it, then you, you take some, a tr somebody trusted, okay? Maybe another, maybe at most three, right? And, and you go and you try and get it taken care of, especially if it's a church issue, okay? You get that thing taken care of, handled. And if for whatever reason, step number two doesn't work, then what do you do? From a church standpoint, then what do you do? And this is really, really hard. Then what do you do? That's when you bring it before the church. And then every time you see them, you cross the, cross the road so you don't have to pass them face to face. Is that the way you do it? You throw a brick through their front window with a note attached to it that says, Pastor Arbuckle said, you better whatever. Is that what you do? No. What do you, what do? You, do? You, you might have to separate yourself from them. You might have to say, and man, how hard would it be to tell somebody as they're coming into church and you know you've been through this process and you basically tell them, I'm sorry you're not welcome. Until you get this thing squared away and right, you're not welcome. That's tough. But then how do you treat them? That's when you start the social media campaign, right? No. What do you do? How do you treat them? You still treat them as a brother or sister in Christ. You still love them, right? You want to see them restored because when, 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 when they're out of sorts with somebody else or the church, who are they also out of sorts with? God. And do you want to see people get right with God or not? Sure you do. And Paul is basically saying, look, there are problems. I know these things, and you need to take care of it because if you don't, in a matter of speaking, uh, undoubtedly he had this in his mind, God will. So he warns them. He also warns them with not only a, a preparation, hey, look, you need to get this because I'm, I'm, my plan is to come as soon as I can. But then he also says to examine themselves. He says there in verse number five, examine yourselves. Whether you be reprobates. The idea is to, and it basically is an application of the word proof. Verse number three, he says, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Basically, his apostleship, his authority was questioned everywhere Paul went. The, the Judaizers came back behind him and so on. And for whatever reason, the Corinthian believers had, had been led to believe that Paul really wasn't what he said he was, an apostle. They wanted proof, okay? Now, he kind of turns the tables on them, and he says, okay, examine yourselves then. You tell me, you say that I'm not an apostle, and we don't have time to go back into the history of it and all of the things that Paul, that Paul did. But now he flips the tables on them and says, okay, you say I'm not an apostle. Well, let me ask you this question. Are you sure you're a Christian? Because, see, there are a lot of people, are there not, even today, who say they're Christians? Well, I'm a Christian. I know a lot of people, I've heard them on the radio, I've, you, you know, I get their little um, news updates and different things and, and the little, little um, articles and whatnot sent to my phone and that kind of thing. They talk about, well, I'm a Christian. And you do a little digging and you find out on their bio on Wikipedia or whatever it is on their website, oh, by the way, guess what? We're not talking about a born-again believer. We're talking about somebody that's not Jewish. 
or Hindu or Muslim. They believe Joseph Smith was a prophet. Maybe it is that they believe that Jesus Christ and Satan were brothers. Jesus was the first created being. You know what groups I'm talking about, by the way? Those are hints. Mormons, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. They consider themselves to be Christians. Now, is that the truth? Not according to the definition that we find in Scripture as far as being a Christian is concerned, but he wanted them to examine their claim to salvation unless they be found to be counterfeit or discredited. And he warns them, prepare yourself. I'm, I'm coming, and when I come, I'm going to take care of this problem. So examine yourselves. And lastly, and he finishes this letter with some encouragement. He says in verse number 9, For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. He says there in verse number 10, he says that he is concerned for their edification, not their destruction. The word wish there could be translated, it is the same word that could be translated pray. He says there, for we are glad, there, there in um, verse, number, verse number nine, this also we pray, even your perfection. Now, is he talking about <laughs> sinless perfection? Boy, wouldn't it be great if, if, if you could pray for sinless perfection? I guess you can. You can pray about it, but you, you can, until we get to heaven, it's not going to happen, right? But would, wouldn't it be something if, and, and, and um, that would be a pretty amazing thing if pastors were given a little, you know, one of those little wands that make people perfect, right? Wouldn't that be something? But he's not talking about that. That word perfect or perfection means spiritually mature. He wants them to be spiritually mature. And why is that necessary? Because even, you know, when we think about somebody being born again, we know from 1 Corinthians that they're often, they're baby Christians. When somebody gets born, is born again, born into the kingdom of, of God through salvation and so forth, uh, what are they? They're babes in Christ. So any pastor and really any person, if they're, they're saved, they shouldn't want to stay that way, should they? I mean... Our, our granddaughter is going to be two years old in a few months, and, and um, we got a little picture from our daughter-in-law of her, and, and she did her hair differently. And I sent, I sent Madison this text, and I said, I love the way she, you did her hair. And she said, I did too, until I realized it makes her look so old. I, I don't remember as a father. Now, moms, you know, I, I, I'm not a mom, so I don't have that mother's love and that kind of thing, you know, and whatnot. I still love my boys. Um, but I, I can't remember ever thinking, I really hope they stay small. Okay. They're, you know, I, I don't know. I, get, I, I don't know. Yes, diapers are expensive. And they go through them <laughs> pretty regularly too, right? Okay. But when you think about your children, what do you want your children to do? You want them to grow up and be healthy. And so it is, spiritually speaking, we ought to want to see people spiritually grow up and be healthy. And Paul is praying that they would be spiritually mature. He's encouraging them. How many have ever had somebody say, I'm praying for you? I'm praying for you. And, 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 and you knew by the way they said it or by watching their life in the past that they meant what they said. Because a lot of times we'll say, well, I'll pray for you, right? But you know, and I know, 
that a lot of times when we say, I'll pray for you, the only reason I said it, sadly, is to kind of get you away from me. <laughs> it's just, okay, I'll pray for you, see you later, bye. You know, that kind of thing. Okay, but Paul is praying. His, his wish for them, his prayer for them is that they become spiritually mature, and that should be a, a, a cause for, of an encouragement for them. Um, he also is encouraging them with God's word. Okay, now when I say that, what am I talking about? Now, granted, he, he undoubtedly referred to a, a, some scripture in his, his writings, but what are the letters that we have of the Apostle Paul? What are they? They're scripture. It is, it is right. There it is. It's the word of God. God. He was inspired to write it. God directed Paul to write this letter, and that should be an encouragement. It it's not, should not only be an encouragement to the Corinthian believers, but who else? All of us, right? And then he encourages them, verses 11 and 12, he says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you all. Greet one another with a holy kiss. What is he saying? He's encouraging them to cultivate grace and love and peace. And how does that happen in a church that has so many, and we already looked at this again, I won't take the time to do it. How does that happen in a church that has all of this sin going on? How does it happen that there be grace and love and peace? The only way all of that can happen in a church that has that many problems is that they get over the problem. They get through the trials. They allow the grace of God to direct them into dealing with the sin that was there and to go on and be the kind of testimonies that they ought to, ought to be. He says the grace and the love and the communion Be with you all. That should be an encouragement not only to us when we face trials, it undoubtedly was to them. But he finishes this this letter with these different approaches. We've already been through it. I'll not take time to give you a, a, a kind of recap where we are. But again, the one lesson I hope you will come away from our study of 2 Corinthians with is that no matter what trial we face, whether it be a personal tr trial in our own lives, maybe it is that we're struggling with sin, maybe it is that there's a difficulty between us and somebody else, maybe it, whatever it is, understand that God's grace is sufficient. And, and it's sufficient it strengthens us and and therefore we can as paul said we can take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions distresses for christ's sake no matter what we can still triumph over the trials because of god's grace let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll we'll look at our prayer sheets and we'll take some time for prayer as well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray that you would help us, Lord, just to better deal with trials, to handle them properly. Help us, Lord, to make sure that as we examine ourselves that we are, in fact, your people. If that is the case, Lord, we pray that you would help us to properly handle the sin that does so easily beset us. Help us, Lord, to, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, 
to be encouraged as we read your word. Help us to go on, Lord, through trials and become more more mature spiritually. Help us to be good testimonies of that to those that come behind us, those that we that are in our, our family, in our church, that are our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for this letter. We thank you for our time, and we pray your blessings upon every circumstance that we'll bring before you now in just a few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.